Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and, and colleagues, a warm welcome from the European office of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels. My name is Hadi Oster and I'm the director of the CAS office here in the capital of Europe. I welcome you all to the second day of this year's Net at Work conference and it is my great pleasure to kick off the second day, which has a series of exciting panel discussions to offer today. But before we start, let me use the opportunity to thank, first of all, the Wilfried Martin Center for organizing the conference again this year in a digital format. We highly appreciate that you made it possible to bring together the EPP affiliated network to exchange views and ideas and engage in discussion. Thank you very much for that. Thank you also to our friends from Austria and Bavaria, the Politische Akademie and the Hans Seidel Stiftung who joined to contribute to the conference just like us. And of course, a big thank to all the participating foundations from all over Europe who joined this conference today. As Mikolaj Tsurinda has rightly pointed out yesterday in his opening remarks, we are living in exceptional times. I won't go into details as you are all familiar with that, but I would like to highlight one point. As the work of party foundations and think tanks is largely based on bringing people together, our work has been quite heavily affected by the pandemic. But the Net at Work Conference is yet another example that we all have learned to adapt quickly to the current challenges and made wide use of digital solutions. It's not always easy. And I found myself amazed of all these possibilities and wonder what would have been our reaction if such a pandemic would have hit us 15, 20 years ago. Maybe I don't even want to know and to imagine. In terms of digitalization, this year has certainly brought a push, and I'm happy that the world is moving forward. And on that note, I would like to turn to the overarching topic of this year's Net at Work Conference, Geopolitical Europe, Adapting, Reshaping, Engaging. As I said, the world is moving forward, and as it is Europe's needs to find its path where it would like to heat towards. As it is often underlined, the EU is absolutely a big player in international system if we look at our economic strength and our role in international trade. But are we a strong player in other fields? In some may be, but we will need to learn to play the role as a strong international political player much, much better. There are many challenges in our direct neighborhood, be it Belarus, be it the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, or the tensions in the Mediterranean Sea with Turkey. Those are only some examples as they are currently on the political agenda and the European Union needs to be able to find solutions regarding such challenges. We will have panels today that also touch these topics, but I would like to raise a general concern here. The discussion that the EU needs to become a stronger geopolitical actor isn't entirely new. It has been discussed for long, and the recent, recent disagreement between French President Manuel Macron and the German Minister of Defense, Annegret kramp karrenbauer around the topic of strategic autonomy shows that there is yet a different understanding. But I'm advocating to finally bring the discussion to a next level in order to, under, to eventually lead to actual challenges. I believe there is a chance in the Conference on the Future of Europe which will hopefully be kicked off soon. I see a chance that this conference could bring concrete results to reform the European Union, not only with regard to the European elections and the Spitzenkandidaten principle, but also regarding the role of the European Union in the world. I believe that this is becoming more and more important to finally newly define it. Right now, we find ourselves in a situation where we will soon have a new US administration. Thankfully, I emphasize, it will be an administration that will play most likely a much more constructive international role. One example is that they will join the Paris Climate Agreement again, and we seem to be much more side by side again in climate questions. But let's not be naive. It might be easier with the Biden administration, but it won't be easy. There are frictions in the transatlantic relations that will remain. Take US tech giants, for example. We are only able to tax Apple, Google, Amazon if we act as a united European Union. An example that shows 
that being a serious international actor isn't only about military strength, but also simply about defining the political areas where we need a coordinated approach. I'm sure our discussions today will touch upon these points as well as others. We will start today with the first panel, the geopolitical challenges of the Eastern Mediterranean and the EU-Turkey relations. After a short break, we will continue with panel two, a Europe that protects its heritage. And at a quarter past three, we will have the panel, the art of the Green Deal, which will follow as panel three. Finally, panel number four will turn to the future of EU enlargement and new momentum for the Western Balkans. We have an exciting program ahead of us. Once again, thank to all of you, to the organizers and participants, and let's go into the discussions. And I pass the floor to Michaelis Sophocles, moderator of panel one. Michaelis, the floor is yours. Hello to everyone from Nicosia. Uh, of course, we would all prefer to be physically in Brussels for the Netherworld Conference and have a much more direct conversation. But even from a distance, we can take advantage of this opportunity uh, to talk to the people uh, by discussing online and using the social media and other technology networks. So let's stick on the bright side of things. Firstly, I would like to thank the president and all our friends uh, at the Martin Center, as well as the Adenauer Institute, for giving us this great opportunity to discuss in depth all the current issues the European project is facing these past few days. I would also like to express my appreciation for the presence of our distinguished speakers here today, all of which have very willingly accepted our invitation uh, for this panel. So allow me uh, to welcome our guest, starting from the Honorable Lady of this panel, Mrs. Dora Bagoyannis, a, a prominent hello, political Greek and po European political figure, member, hello, member of the European Parliament of the Parliament, and former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Greece. Uh, the broad understanding of issues, uh, especially issues of European and foreign policy, and the analytical way of thinking shown by uh, Mrs. Bagrian during the years is always impressive. I have to confess, to confess myself, not only that I follow her political activity for decades, but it has influenced my own way of thinking a lot. So welcome, Mrs. Bagrian, to our panel today. Thank you. We also have with us the former president of Parliamentary Assembly, Mr. Paolo, from Italy, a politician of his own opinion with a lot of experience both on the European and the Atlantic level, as well as on the energy field. I had the opportunity this past few days, few days to check Mr. Ali's uh, very direct way of expressing his own views on issues. And I was quite impressed uh, by it. I'm sure that uh, his contribution in this session will be of high importance. But to mention that the only non-speaker non in this uh, conversation will keep us focused on the international level of this discussion. Mr. Ali, thank you very much for joining us and I would like to welcome you here. Thank you. The Glavkos Kleridis Institute and ex Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cyprus, Mr. Ioannis Kasulidis. Mr. Kasulidis has been, for me, the most valuable political mentor since I was a very young person. Uh, his ability to be aware of what is happening and why it's happening on every corner of, of our planet is always outstanding. Being a true European, the Cypriot politician that not only knows, knows in depth, but has handled extensively the issue we are discussing today. I am sure that his contribution will be enlightening, enlightening for all of us in this conversation. Mr. Kasulidis, you are just a few kilometers away, but let me welcome you online as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are here today 
to discuss the geopolitical challenges of the Eastern Mediterranean and the uh, European Union-Turkey relations. Two highly interconnected issues that are already creating very vivid discussions in every level of the European institutions, to the point that the European Union's ability to play a geopolitical role in its own neighborhood has been put into question. We have the energy issue and the European Union's energy security question. The formation of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum and the signing of the East Med deal. We are also experiencing the illegal research and drilling activities from Turkey, both in Greece and Cyprus. Initiatives that cost twice so far a standoff between two very strong naval forces, uh, the Greek and the Turkish one in the Aegean, two countries that are also allies within the NATO framework. We have the ongoing co conflicts in Syria, Libya, and nagorno karabakh during which major violations of the international law have taken place, especially from the Turkish side. We have the acquisition of the, the Russian anti-aircraft S-400 missile, missiles by Turkey that created a lot of tensions in NATO, but have not been responded in a tangible number, manner by anyone. We have the illegal opening of the Gulf city of the occupied uh, by the, of the occupied Gulf city by the Turkish troops uh, from Augusta in Cyprus, I, uh, uh, an action against a number of UN resolutions that also jeopardizes the efforts to solve the Cyprus, for which now Turkey now claims that it wants a permanent division. All these things uh, have caused a lot of discussion on, on, on the European strategic autonomy issue and sovereignty, especially since many doubts have risen about Americans, about the America's long-term commitment to global leadership and European security, and the future and the role of the transatlantic alliance. At the same time, Russia and Turkey are, are playing, mostly in conjunction, a much more efficient geopolitical role in the region, taking advantage of the retreat of the United States and the absence of a European effective foreign policy. Turkey continues to be an EU candidate member state, and uh, it takes, let's say, 10 hostile steps, and then moving back a bit before each European Council. There is a lot of tension and discussion on its relation with Europe, as well as whether economic sanctions should be imposed on it or not. France, France and Germany are, are already leading the debate on the European level, on European uh, geopolitical challenges, expressing opinions that are creating also tensions within the European fr framework the past few weeks. So my first question is, why is all this situation important? How does the European, uh, how does the Eastern Mediterranean and everything that happens in the area reflect on the European Union? Is it, is it just a matter of Greece and Cyprus feeling threatened, or is it actually a European issue, what we are facing these days? Mrs. Bagoyani, let me begin with you. Well, thank you, Mr. Sophocles. Thank you to all of you. I would like to be there. Unfortunately, the pandemic does not allow us to be together, so we have uh, to start uh, um, with these possibilities which are given to us. Allow me to start by setting the stage and the state of play in East Mediterranean, focusing in the past two years or so, given that this has been the time frame of the everlasting arising tensions, even hostility in the region. Prior to that, the East Med region has been primarily challenged by the migration crisis and the refugee waves historically by the Cypriot issue, and highlighted by the cooperation triangles between Greece, Cyprus, and Israel on the one hand, and Greece, Cyprus, and Egypt on the other. To make a long story short, over the years and through difficulties, key countries around the East Mediterranean have opted for cooperation and collaboration, be it in security, in energy, in migration, all all countries except but one, Turkey. Turkey has dramatically shifted its position and policy in the past two years from merely a challenging one to an aggressive and threatening behavior. To paraphrase a known saying, 
Turkey is no longer wants the entire cake and to eat two, but is moving towards aggressively grabbing the cake. This change of stance has manifested in various occasions prior to the pandemic and has culminated ever since. The main terrain where Turkey manifests its defiance and disregard is that of international law and the legal rules that guarantee a peaceful coexistence between sovereign states. Turkey has systematically violated internationally recognized norms or attempted to redefine them unilaterally. Both Greece's and Cyprus' exclusive economic zones are challenged and violated by Turkey on a daily basis for years now in an attempt to muddy the waters and infringe on the sovereignty of neighboring countries. This disregard of international law reached new heights when Turkey signed a memorandum with Libya that not only violated the international law of the sea, both customary and written, but it violated logic and geography itself. That memorandum tried to convince the world that Turkey and Libya have bordering economic zones, erasing from the map entire Greek islands like Rhodes and Crete. In 2020, the situation deteriorated even further. Turkey moved forward from provocative rhetoric on redefining borders and changing the Lausanne Treaty to concrete aggressive actions. In February 2020, at the early stages of the pandemic, Greece came faced with an hybrid attack on its borders with Turkey. Hundreds of thousands of migrants were within nights pushed to the Greek land border of Evros, while at the same time, a misinformation campaign with fake news and fake videos spread regionally on social media in what constituted a coordinated act by Turkey towards Greece and Europe. While before migrants were instrumentalized by Turkey for economic gains and bargaining power, on February, they became pawns at a new revisionist strategy that aims to change the balance of power and geography in the East Mediterranean region. This should not be seen as an exaggeration. If we think of Turkey, compare its policy towards its neighboring countries, we can detect a clear attempted strategy for geographic and political reform. Syria, Iraq, Libya, Cyprus, Nagorno-Karabakh, Greece, are examples and cases where Turkey has pursued or it's currently pursuing a revisionist and aggressive policy that has taken monetary and economic form and even military intervention and weapon supply. In Libya, Turkey has systematically and so far successfully interfered, styling the peace process by supplying weapons and fire fighters. A few months ago, Turkey came face to face with France due to the fact that it denied the search of vessel in one of its ships that was headed to Libya, and the same incident repeated itself last week, this time with Germany. In Libya, as in Syria, Europe was, and to a large extent still is, unable to promote and safeguard its own security interests. This is evident not just for Turkey, but for other players like Russia and China. Turkey is simply the one that is seizing the moment to make gains as many as possible. Its success story in Syria and Libya, Turkey is further implementing it in Nagorno-Karabakh. Through aggressive and revisionistic rhetoric, supply of arms and fighters, and during a time when the world is distracted with the pandemic, the U.S. elections and the economic turmoil, Turkey is making its geopolitical move to gain regional power and challenge the status quo. Europe can no longer be dormant or turn a blind eye to that policy, for it will irrevocably damage its interests and its values. The first reaction came yesterday. 
from the European Parliament, and it was a very clear message to Turkey. Turkey can no longer be seen as a Greek or Cyprus bilateral issue. When Turkey violates Greece's exclusive economic zone, sending research and military vessels, which is happening today as we speak, then Turkey is violating European interests, European sea borders. When Turkey threatens Greece and Cyprus with war, then Europe is threatened with war. In August, Greece and Turkey came dramatically close to a military standoff that has been looming over the East Med ever since. In Cyprus, Turkey interfered with elections and violated decades of Security Council resolutions, reopening occupied territories and setting ablaze all attempts for a solution to the Cyprus issue. At the same time, President Erdogan has been using hate speech against European leaders, instrumentalizing religion and faith, turning museums like Hagia Sophia and Karyak Museum into mosques, portraying himself as the sole protector of Islam. There is a well-thought strategy here, a grab for power and authoritarianism, which Europe cannot just ignore. These are real geopolitical challenges, and above all, a challenge of values, of principles, that cannot be fixed by throwing money at the problem. Europe needs to acknowledge that above challenges need to pull the head out of the sand, observe how the Mediterranean, North Africa, Middle East, and all the regions around it have been changing dramatically over the years and finally take ownership of its role and its purpose in the region. Europe can no longer be disillusional about the role of the United States. There is a new reality today, one very different from what we thought. In the prevailing, if uh, the prevailing of the US in the world order signaled the end of history for Francis Fukuyama in 1992, then today history is ending again. The US we knew is no longer here and will no longer be in the future. President Trump may have lost the elections and President-elect Biden will hopefully restore faith and trust in multilateralism and global cooperation. But what became evident in the past four years is that the US world's presence and role as the keeper of the order has ended. It is a paradigm shift in which we must adapt and evolve. When it comes to Turkey, Europe has been dangling the carrot while afraid to use the stick. I'm not an advocate of aggression and always opted for dialogue and communication. And I'm well, very well known in Greece for that. Yet, when the stick loses its value, then the carrot is not enough and the other party will go for a bigger bite. Europe must come to this realization sooner than later and step up its game. Europe must redefine its relations with Turkey in a comprehensive and consistent manner. I believe we need to pursue a clear and all-encompassing deal with Turkey in the same format like the one we pursue with the UK. From trade relations to migration, to security and defense, to values and democratic principles, we as Europe need to make clear to Turkey and every other country that takes recourse in revisionism that frank cooperation and collaboration is welcome, yet the fundamental European interests will be protected. Put forth a win-win situation that will respect the interests of all, but it will not disregard the white vital interests of Europe itself and of its member states. To conclude, I have said in the past that I would like to have been a Minister of Foreign Affairs of Luxembourg, but I haven't been that lucky. What I mean by that is that we cannot change geography, dear friends, at least not as we tried to do so in the past. We know better now. 
As such, we need to learn to coexist with others and we Europeans need to be united and in solidarity. Europe has made the choice long ago to come together, to pursue prosperity, peace for its people as one. We need to be able to defend and promote that choice, that prosperity. We need to be able to defend our region and our neighborhood, for it is and it will be our home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sofoclaus. We thank you, Mrs. Pacoyani, a lot. I know your quote about the stick and the carrot. When the stick loses, as you said, the carrot is never enough. And having said that, I would like to ask Mr. Ali's uh, point of view. And I hope we have a, a transatlantic uh, point of view as well uh, in your state. Thank you. Well, first of all, I have to say that um, uh, the, the Turkey issue is not a bilateral issue uh, between Turkey and uh, Greece or Cyprus. It's not only an issue um, which influences Europe, but it's also a concern for NATO, of course, as it was said before. It's a, a concern for the United States. It's a concern for global uh, scenarios. But let, let me make it just an assumption, uh, starting with my speech. Uh, I think that the Mediterranean Sea in the, in the past years has regained its centrality in world geopolitics. Unfortunately, the centrality has been gained uh, for growing instability. But we have to try to turn these uh, problems into opportunities. I don't repeat what are the challenges in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea now, because it has been said very clearly by, um, by Madame Bakoyanis and also in the, the very good introduction of our moderator. Uh, I probably will say something different uh, on, on some issues, but anyway, uh, regarding Turkey, well, uh, Turkey, uh, has been used for decades by the West, including Europe, United States and NATO, as a buffer against the Soviet Union, against the instabilities coming from Middle East, including Iran and so on. Uh, Turkey has also been, uh, how to say, discussing with Europe about possible uh, uh, entering the European Union. And of course, uh, I'm not in favor of that, of course, but for years we have given the impression to Turkey that uh, uh, there might be chances, then uh, we stop the dialogue. And this has given uh, further fuel to the engine of uh, Erdogan for his wavering politics. Uh, Turkey has a long democratic tradition, but Erdogan now seems to have completely lost control of the situation and probably control of himself. Uh, I, I have um, had for five years in my uh, mandate at the NATO Parliamentary Assembly a lot of uh, opportunities to interact with the uh, Greek delegation, the Turkish delegation, and so on. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, something which changed the, dramatically the, the position of Turkey and position of Erdogan was the failed uh, coup in 2016, July 2016. I remember I was there to see the bombing and uh, the consequences of, of, of the attempt. And I think that uh, from this point on, from that point on, uh, um, Erdogan has uh, increased progressively its wavering politics. Now he's completely unstable. So I, I, I will generally prefer to distinguish between a people and the leadership. I do the same with Russia because I think that the, the Russian people is a great people, but uh, I don't rely, rely uh, in any way on uh, Vladimir Putin, for example, from my personal experience. Um, by the way, um, Turkey has been for decades a loyal ally in NATO. It's, uh, it has the second armed forces of the alliance. So we must keep in mind this, not just to justify anything of what is happening, but just to keep in mind as, as a broader scenario. 
Um, well, I would like to, to open a little bit the, the scenario. It was already been uh, uh, said by our moderator and uh, also by, by Madam Bakoyanis. Uh, I, I was looking at the map and the Cyprus is exactly in, in the middle of two different conflicts which have the same actors, Libya and Nagorno-Karabakh, more or less 1,300 kilometers from Cyprus. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the common item is Turkey and Russia playing the same game. I know quite well the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh because for five years uh, I spoke to, uh, about uh, the, this item with the Armenian delegation and the uh, Azerbaijan delegation to NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, well, I think that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is important not only for what is happening now in the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, for the relationship between uh, uh, Russia and Turkey, for the confrontation which is happening between Russia and uh, Turkey there, which is the same problem in Libya, which is the same problem for the control of, of the Mediterranean, particularly the Eastern Mediterranean, because we, we never mentioned Russia. But Russia's interest in controlling the access to the Black Sea is, has been one of the reasons why Russia uh, intervened in Syrian conflict to control the harbors, the Syrian harbors on the, on the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. This must be kept clear in mind. Putin is strongly interested in what is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. And Putin is not a friend of Europe. We know quite well. So, okay, we have to, to blame Turkey for what is happening, but we, we cannot forget Putin. And uh, some say that the conclusion of the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh has been a victory of Putin. My opinion is exactly the, the reverse. Uh, I think that the, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict has been, since at least 12 years, the conflict of Mr. Putin. And now Putin, for the first time, failed to control the game because Turkey went in. Uh, I don't go into details, but I just uh, mention one thing, that uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, legally speaking, is a region of Azerbaijan. So I don't understand what the Armenian army does inside the Azerbaijan territory. Because if we speak about inter uh, territorial integrity, the, the international right is not on the side of Armenia. I am personally a friend of the Armenians, they are Christians. Uh, I think they, they have uh, had a very difficult history, but I don't think uh, uh, that we can solve the problem without uh, taking into consideration the international law, because otherwise we have to forget the international law also in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. We cannot use the double standard, of course, in mm -hmm. our approach. Uh, so I think that uh, Turkey and Russia are playing a role in the Mediterranean region, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in other places. This is due also, or mainly, to the absence of Europe and to the absence of the United States. Don't forget this. Um, now, I think, uh, what are uh, the players which can determine the future uh, of, of the region? I, I, I have to say three players, uh, NATO, the US, and uh, Europe. Regarding NATO, well, NATO is the only common table today between Turkey and Greece. Uh, NATO, uh, Turkey has demonstrated to be very wavering also in this, uh, in its position in, in NATO. It's very difficult for NATO to deal with uh, Turkey today, but uh, um, having a common place to discuss is better than nothing. Don't forget that NATO also has a permanent com committee with Russia. So um, NATO is uh, now much more than in the past is political and military alliance. It was military and political. Now it's political and military. So this is a, um, a field of uh, discussion. Um, we have to remember that the NATO philosophy is project stability outside its border. 
Putin idea is export instability because instability is in favor of his policy and Turkey is, is in between sometimes with NATO sometimes with itself sometimes with Russia um, the US well uh, I agree that the the election of Biden can change uh, several issues particularly regarding multilateralism because uh, as it was uh, already said, multilateralism is the only way to control uh, such situations. Um, well, and of course, the continuous strategy of Trump of um, trying to destroy multilateralism has given rise to bilateral approaches. And we see those also in the Mediterranean region, of course. Uh, but Trump has done also something Good. He has started dialogues between Israel, Abu Dhabi, and Bahrain, between Serbia and Kosovo. The last visit of Secretary Pompeo to Greece and Turkey seemed to start a similar approach. Is it propaganda? Maybe. I think so. But again, it's better than nothing. And so now the US are called to, to have a new approach to the, to the region. I hope. Biden will not follow the disaster of President Obama. And Biden was the vice president with Obama because Obama uh, was prisoner of his uh, Nobel Prize for peace and he withdrew from the Middle East, uh, giving rise to the consequences we have seen in the last past years in Syria and Iraq. So Biden will have a, a great challenge in the Mediterranean region to decide if he wants to, to be again protagonist or not. And last, Europe. Uh, many things has, uh, have already been said, and I agree, of course. Uh, uh, I don't know sanctions or not uh, that will be decided by the European uh, Parliament and institutions. Um, of course, uh, also in this case, uh, we cannot forget uh, dialogue. Even if it's very difficult uh, to have dialogue with Erdogan, but uh, we cannot only uh, have um, uh, a, uh, an approach based on strength. We have to balance strength and dialogue because strength and dialogue are the two faces of the coin, the two sides of the coin. Uh, strength without dialogue is violence. Dialogue without strength is submission. The problem is that the question is, is Europe today strong enough to start a dialogue or to go on a dialogue with Turkey, uh, balancing strength and dialogue? This is a question mark. I, I don't have the answer, but it's a, it's a question mark. Uh, I think that the final goal could be uh, a special treaty between Europe and Turkey, including energy, migration, trading, defense, and so on. But uh, it's not yet the time because we need two conditions. A reliable Turkey, and Turkey will not be reliable until Erdogan is, is in, and a strong political Europe, and unfortunately, in my opinion, Europe is not uh, yet so strong politically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali. I know, that, and, and I want to stress the way you you put all the players on the table. I mean, uh, the, the Russia, Turkey, NATO, the United States, and the European Union, because all this situation is affecting, obviously, everyone. And with that, I would like the, to give the floor to Mr. Kasulidis. Uh, Mr. Kasulidis, you are considered the architect of all these trilateral associations in the area. And maybe you can also give us uh, your views on how the area can help itself in this situation. Yes, thank you very much. And I salute my fellow speaker, since I have the floor. Let me say that I will not center my intervention to the uh, Greece, Cyprus and Turkey matter, because I fully subscribe to what Mrs. Pagoyani has on the other hand, my answer to your question, my dear moderator, is exactly this. 
what is the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean, which goes as further away as the Arab Peninsula, and how the Eastern Mediterranean, the moderate countries of the Eastern Mediterranean, they are mainly Sunni Arab countries, and, and uh, Israel can help themselves. And I begin by saying that the, the region, as I have described it, is suffering from polarization, from realignment, and by this realignment I mean that the poles, the one hand, on the one hand, are three poles, <laughs> not as physics say two. So, on the one hand, we have Iran and its non state actors affiliated with Iran, like Hezbollah, like the Iraqi militias, uh, like the Houthis in Yemen, and of course, the Islamists in Libya. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, the moderate Arab countries, the monarchies, plus Egypt um, and um, Israel, who share the, a common threat nowadays, a common threat coming from Iran in the first place. And uh, this um, is leading to a realignment between these moderate Arab countries for the first time. And then uh, we have a smaller pole, the alliance between Turkey and Qatar, who advocate a, the ideology of political Islam. And through this um, effort, they undermine the stability in the monarchies in the area and in um, and in Israel and Egypt, which is not a monarchy. So, first of all, there is a de facto realignment in 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 this region, a realignment that may uh, contribute to a stability in the region by these countries that are mind-like mind to uh, group together and uh, in this way uh, a multilateral forum of the Eastern Mediterranean to which the two direct neighbors of these groups, which is Greece and Cyprus, can participate in this bringing the link with the European Union and its common foreign and security policy alongside. Now, Turkey, with its revisionist policy, has um, played a destabilizing in all the areas where managed to get herself into Syria, Iraq, um, Libya, and Nagorno Karabakh. Turkey also does not, is not the faithful ally anymore. Years long past when Turkey was a faithful ally into NATO. On the contrary, Turkey doesn't hesitate to come into conflict or threaten the use of force, both to two member states of the European Union, Cyprus and Greece, 
of which one, Greece, is also a member of the NATO alliance. Putin. Agree with Mr. Ali and the role that Vladimir Putin is playing and what his interests are. But I'm afraid that if we evaluate the role by Turkey in its relations with uh, Vladimir Putin, we will see that it's more likely to be in connivance with Vladimir Putin rather than the United States and Europe. There is no need in me elaborating on this, but there are so many facts and examples that attest to this. What is Europe seeking? It's seeking stability in its neighborhood. It's looking, it's seeking to bring more stability in the region of the Eastern Mediterranean, as I have described it. It has a strength. It depends to what strength. Military strength? No. But economic strength? Yes. If we are talking about leverage on Turkey, and if we look at Turkey and its uh, uh, relations in trade and economic relations with the European Union, the European Union is much more stronger than the United States. And it can use this leverage in a way that it will uh, warn Turkey about its policy and it, its policies and make it understood that these policies are not satisfac satisfactory at all vis-a-vis the European Union. And I think that in the NATO alliance, I also see that the role of Mr. Putin is to keep open all the wounds in the NATO alliance and is not in favor of the solution of any of the problems is rather sustaining them for his own interests. And in this, Turkey plays the game of Mr. Putin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kasulidis. Uh, all of you have talked and for the regional approach, because I think it's very important for everyone to be happening in this area before getting into how it's affecting uh, all the rest. But all of you have spoken about between strength and dialogue. Europe has to play that, NATO has to play. All of you talked about uh, the retreat of, of the United States and what is happening with NATO nowadays, and how will uh, the transition of power to Mr. Biden will affect uh, the defense uh, policy of Europe and the, and the uh, foreign policy of Europe. There is this debate this past few weeks between France, especially Fra uh, the French President, Mr. Macron, and the German defense, mini, uh, defense minister, Mrs. AKK, as we are used to, uh, to call her. Uh, whether, despite the fact that uh, Biden is getting the presidency after the election, Europe should work towards its strategic autonomy, or whether it should continue to, to depend uh, on NATO and the United States. No one is saying that NATO should be abandoned. It's the, the level of its role that is being questioned. So I would like to I, I would like to ask all three of you uh, your position on this matter and how the handling of Turkey is affecting all this conversation and the handling of the Eastern European question nowadays and the geopolitical role of Europe 
vis-à-vis -vis what Mr. Ali has pointed out, the either cooperation or, or, or disputes of interest between Russia and Turkey these days. Ms. Pagoyan. Well, thank you. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, a long story, so it might be a, yes. a, a little bit longer answer. Let me just start by saying uh, I followed very closely what Mr. Ali said about Nagorno-Karabakh. I was the chair of the OSCE for one year and dealt a lot uh, with this frozen conflict, traveled a lot both to Azerbaijan and to Armenia, trying to find a way uh, to solve the problem. Mr. Ali is right. Legally, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, it was the territory of Azerbaijan, which we spoke about, and um, Armenia uh, had, uh, it was a little bit similar to the Cyprus issue, what uh, happened in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. On the other side, the Armenians have had uh, a very long presence in the region, and uh, the numbers were not the same with Cyprus because the Armenians were much more uh, than the Azeris. But anyway, uh, what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, was a little bit, to me, uh, allow me to be blunt here, uh, a very cynical way that uh, Russia and Mr. Putin dealt with the issue. When two years ago the, the, uh, the government in, Nago in Armenia changed uh, after this so-called Velvet Revolution uh, in Armenia, it was a new government which felt the need to be more independent from Russia than the other governments were before this. So this was something which Russia did not like at all. Uh, coming afterwards uh, uh, at the crossroad uh, between Armenia and Turkey, it was very clear that Mr. Putin, and it was very clear also by his statements, uh, the balance was in favor of Turkey. So that's why he tried to keep all this, uh, the, the, pre the Russian presence in the region, yes, but on the other side, he did not speak out and did not say clearly what uh, the Turkish position was in Nagorno-Karabakh and how the Turkey intervened in Nagorno-Karabakh, both with fighters and with um, uh, guns. So it was a very, um, very cynical um, uh, reading of uh, Russian interests in the region. And it was very clear that Mr. Putin preferred to keep his relations with Turkey intact. Uh, so what is happening, what will uh, happen now? Uh, I'm uh, afraid that uh, the whole situation uh, is, uh, has arrived at a moment where we have to be very, very clear with ourselves. And we have to be we have to speak the truth between us. And the truth is that NATO is in an extremely difficult position and that this Pontus Pilatus uh, reaction from NATO is something that for NATO itself is very difficult to keep up in the future. Where NATO cannot just say that we are unhappy uh, because uh, Turkey uh, bought uh, the S-400 we are unhappy because um, uh, Turkey used the S-400. We were not happy because uh, Turkey menaced uh, NATO airplanes uh, with the Russian S-400. Uh, that we are not happy that uh, a NATO alliance ship like, uh, like the French ship uh, uh, was menaced by another NATO alliance. So uh, I think that it is very clear that we arrive at a moment where the whole role of NATO, uh, I'm not going as far as President Macron, but the whole role of NATO uh, will be put in question. And NATO has to clear its position on a lot of issues. Now, I'm a long supporter of European uh, strategic uh, uh, independence. 
uh, very few of us were at the time when we start speaking about that. Uh, I'm afraid that a lot of my colleagues at the time felt that uh, um, we Greeks can uh, say that because we give 2% of our GDP uh, to defense. But uh, the truth is that, yes, Mr. Kasulidis is right. Uh, the economic force of Europe is very big, but we cannot have a common foreign and defense policy if our defense is not also there. So I hope that uh, dealing with all these questions we are dealing today, we will realize soon enough that we these conversations which are starting now will have to go on and that we have to realize if the European impact is what we would like it to be, that this impact will be only be possible if we, our military presence is also possible. The third and last um, point I would like to make is, Mr. Kasulidis mentioned it, towards Turkey. We are the first trade partner of Turkey, the Europe. We are representing 500 million people. And we are able today with President Erdogan, and that's where I disagree with uh, uh, Mr. Ali, uh, I know President Erdogan for years. He is a, a man who quite easily adapts to reality, uh, which means that uh, he has not a lot of difficulties in realizing um, what uh, he has to do and change positions. Uh, so I believe that we don't have to wait. We have to be very clear with uh, Turkey and with President Erdogan today, not tomorrow, not after tomorrow, postponement of the situation will only create more problems and be clear with him. Yes, we want good relations with Turkey. Yes, we want to, uh, Turkey to be our trade partner, which is also extremely important for Turkey, mainly in the economic situation Turkey is now. Yes, we want to have an agreement on the refugees, on the uh, emigrants, etc. But this means that Turkey has to abide to international law and to the rules. We will not change our value system to adapt to the Turkish value system. We, Turkey has to adapt to our value system. Turkey has to agree that we are ready to go to international court for the differences, to agree uh, based on international law to agreements. But this is something which has to be agreed from the Turkish side. So what I'm saying and what I'm supporting is, yes, there might be a win-win situation, but this win-win situation will come when Turkey will realize that the other way is a loose situation for Turkey, which means that we need at the time both the sanctions on the table, and when I'm speaking about sanctions, I mean real sanctions, sanctions which will uh, make Turkey face a new reality. And on this basis, we might have a new agreement with Turkey. We cannot wait, because if we wait, the deterioration of Turkey's democracy will be even bigger than what it is already today. The deterioration of the economic situation in Turkey will be bigger. A, a Turkey in a big economic and social problem is not an easy partner. It's even more dangerous in the future. So I would say that Europe has to realize that we cannot wait for any kind of uh, uh, America's uh, intervention as we are, unfortunately, my generation of politicians are still used to think that we have to take our own uh, faith in our hands. Last but not least, Europe has to understand 
that we are the north of the Mediterranean. The south is on the other side of the Mediterranean, but the Mediterranean is our sea. So we have to understand that if we want to have our part of the Mediterranean in a, a stable situation, it is extremely important that our presence in the south of the Mediterranean is strong and is reliable and is effective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bagoyanni. Uh, you've, uh, you've, given me, you've given me something to ask Mr. Ali, because you said we must not wait for America's intervention anymore. Uh, Mr. Biden declared the day before yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, that America is back. What does that mean? What does that mean for NATO? What does that mean for the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean, that you pointed out before, that it has regained its centrality? Mr. Ali. Well, first of all, I never said that we, we must wait that Erdogan is out of the game. Uh, we must act immediately, as uh, other Makoyanis Mac were saying. I, I fully agree. Uh, I was just trying to to give a, a broader view on what is happening. And uh, regarding NATO, well, uh, Madam Bakoyani said uh, NATO is, uh, it has an extremely difficult position. Yes, particularly difficult after four years of continuous delegitimation by President Trump. We must remember that if the uh, main stakeholder of the alliance withdraws or every, every day says, no, NATO is obsolete and blah, blah, blah. Of course, the political power of NATO decreases. The military power is still there. Uh, but politically speaking, difficulties are more important. So it's not a point that we wait for the United States. But of course, NATO is strongly determined in its political action by the United States. So I hope Biden will will revert to the the trend uh, respect to President Trump, and I think this is will be also useful in the discussion with Turkey because Turkey had the chance to uh, take advantage from the fact that uh, the, the United States was saying, "Okay, NATO uh, is not important for us." Of course. Um, Regarding the NATO and the European Union uh, and uh, European defense, you know that uh, the, com uh, defense of, uh, the common defense of Europe was uh, an idea of Alcide de Gasperi in the 50s. Then uh, it has uh, come back since three, four years. The first uh, uh, people speaking about that uh, were Federica Mogherini and Jens Stoltenberg. I'm a good friend of Federica Mogherini, a very good friend of... Uh, of General Graziano, who is now the head of the military structure of the European Union. Well, they have put together 72 common projects which, which are going on. The, the transition to a European common defense is very long and it's very difficult because there is a problem of each individual army, each individual state and so on. But we are, we are going on. We must go on, but we cannot, we cannot say that as President Macron, well, now we need a common army. It, it, it takes time for that. But we are progressing. Uh, last point, uh, I fully agree uh, about the cynical uh, behavior of Putin in, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Putin uh, has great interest with, with Baku, with Azerbaijan for the oil. And uh, at the same time, he uh, sells weapons to Armenia. So um, I say that uh, this has been one of Putin's conflicts, not, 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 not only frozen conflict, it's one of the Putin's conflict, including uh, uh, Donbass, Crimea, including uh, Transnistria, including uh, uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and so on. Uh, I just, uh, I just uh, wanted to, to say, I think, in 2016, when uh, Putin uh, announced the, the withdrawal of some troops from Syria, three days after that, uh, the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh started again, and it was an attack by, from the Armenians to, to, to the Azeri. Uh, I don't believe in coincidence in politics. I never believe in coincidence. 
If you go back and see the dates, that, that's very clear. So this is the reason why I, I say that uh, uh, the Nagorno Karabakh, yes, is a, um, how to say, uh, and I, um, an attempt of Putin of not uh, having too many discussions with Turkey, but it's mainly his defeat in this specific conflict. Just, just a point regarding uh, Moldova, which seems to be so far, but, uh, well, of course, I welcome the, uh, the election of uh, Madame Sandu as president of the uh, Moldova Republic. Uh, I say we have to keep our eyes very open because I, I can expect uh, something in Transnistria. Remember the Transnistria military, military occupied by the Russians. So I don't think uh, that uh, Putin will accept uh, the decision of, uh, of the Moldova people to elect a pro-European leader. Uh, there are already problems in Transnistria. I hope it will not become a warm conflict. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Uh, inter the, the last point was very, very interesting. It is something we should uh, uh, we should be following. Uh, the last question by you, Mr. Kasulidis, besides the first question, can actually Turkey geoba geobartize the unity of the European Union itself or NATO? I, you are a, a European with a lot of years in European institutions. So I would like to have your view on that. Well, definitely it will not jeopardize the unity, is too far-fetched to say, but it's creating problems in attrition to the cohesion of the NATO alliance and of the European Union. And I don't see something everybody is saying quietly, but everybody accepts it uh, loudly that the that Turkey is not a European country in not join the European Union. We shall have to be sincere with Turkey and we should have to say to Turkey in so many words and of course Mr. Ali has mentioned about uh, another treaty, something else, a special relationship but definitely, if Turkey joins the European Union, yes, the European Union will never be the same, and it will be to the detriment of the European Union. Now, let me return to the issue of defense and the role of, uh, of the new incoming American administration. Definitely, uh, Mr. Biden, will return to more traditional foreign policy in favor of multilateralism, and NATO is a multilateral forum, is an alliance. He will treat his allies with much more respect instead of the rude way that Mr. Uh, Trump was treating them, who at the same time was expressing admiration to the autocrats and dictators in the world, the likes of Putin, of uh, Xi Jinping, or Erdogan. Uh, this will definitely change. But the entrenchment policy of the United States, which quite, quite correctly, uh, Mr. Ali has mentioned it, the, uh, the United States started this entrenchment with the pivot policy of Mr. Obama, and they will not return to the region the same way knew it before. Therefore, the region will have to depend on the stakeholders of the region and save uh, a number of their problems. Neither the calls from Washington, D.C., to the Europeans about the need to strengthen their defense spending will stop. And uh, that is why I agree with President Macron, saying that if we are going to increase 
to that importance our defense spending, we might as well do it to an autonomous defense policy of the European Union. Not a divorce from NATO, certainly not, but this autonomy, I agree with Mr. Rally, will go by step by step until it comes to the to a position where it will be really called a common defense. Although I want to finish with the fact that the European Union has to show its strength, which is, I repeat, an economic leverage, to countries like Turkey, to countries like those that are uh, uh, threatening the cohesion and stability of the EU. Finally, the fact that uh, the issue of the Nagorno Karabakh, which is, has been mentioned legally and according to international law. It was a Azerbaijan territory, and therefore the principle of territorial integrity applied to Azerbaijan, certainly. Certainly, the issue of Sessendidis, Lombas, in Transnistria, in uh, Abkhazia, uh, and Northern Ossetia, etc., these are no longer frozen conflict, they can become very hot and all over Stadium. But I haven't heard, I'm not saying that I'm jealous, but I haven't heard the same rhetoric to be used about the occupation of 40% of the Cyprus Republic and the fact that the issue of international law and the issue of uh, territorial should have been immense gets forgotten. Why I don't uh, misunderstand Mr. Ali? Because it tends to be forgotten and it tends to be left to its fate. Thank you. Mr. Kasulis, that note, and uh, allow me as a Cypriot politician to. <laughs> Uh, to close uh, this conversation on that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on time. Uh, and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your participation. I'm sure uh, whoever uh, our audience today uh, is uh, more wealthy in terms of uh, geopolitics, geostrategy, and Europe and NATO that are, are going through turbulent times. And uh, on on the ideas you've put on the table on how to handle, especially Turkey in the area that is causing these problems nowadays, but the rest of the issues that are, are expected to arise in the in the in the following times. Thank you very very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye.